I'm joined by Dr. Webster Griffin Tompley, all fan historian. Welcome to the program, sir. Doctor, uh, it seems that uh, the war on Syria is being discussed more openly as it was with Qatar, is literally speaking of waging an all out war. Uh, why not respect and give dialogue a chance? Well, of course, you're, you're dealing with, uh, with a, um, a planned destabilization. The plan is to destroy Syria. This proposal comes from the Thani family, the rulers of Qatar. Uh, they are, of course, an oppressive dynasty of absolute monarchs. Uh, it's an emirate, after all. Uh, if any place in the Middle East needs a revolution, it's Qatar. Uh, and, of course, what he's proposing is that other people would go and get killed because Qatar does not have any forces that could carry this out. And when he says Arab, this is also somewhat puzzling, uh, because he's really talking about Turkey, I'm afraid, which would mean that it wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be Arab. So this is a mass of double talk and deception. I think he's responding to two things. First of all, Russia. Russia has been hanging tough. We just had the meeting of Brahimi, the, the uh, UN mediator, with Bogdanov of the Russian Foreign Ministry and Burns, of the U.S. State Department, and Russia did not cave. Uh, the U.S. was pressing to get the uh, departure of Assad as a precondition to anything else, uh, and that has been rejected. So the big uh, push to try to break the will of Russia has failed, and that's a plus. Uh, Brahimi, of course, also condemned by Syria as being flagrantly biased. That would be useful if Russia would come out and say that uh, Brahimi is flagrantly biased. Now, on the ground, though, what you're hearing about here is that the rebels have taken the Taftanaz military airport in the north. The terrorist al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, the al-Qaeda army has seized this military airport. But less attention is going to a more important engagement that I can see, which is that the Syrian Arab army has retaken Daraya, which is the key to a larger and more important military base in the outskirts of Damascus, which is very close to the government ministries and the presidential palace. So if it's an exchange of military bases, the Syrian army has definitely won this. And we're also getting reports that there was a large concentration of mass al-Nusra terrorists in uh, Daraya, and that they may have fared very poorly in the last phase of the engagement. That also raises the question, how long can these terrorists go on? That is, they're drawing on a finite pool. The attrition rates among the terrorists are very high. We're told that Tunisians are now being brought in massively, but uh, at a certain point, they're going to run out of terrorists, uh, and at that point, the rebellion may be in big trouble. Of course, uh, you, you spoke of uh, uh, Turkey as well. I mean, just how has Turkey summed up the costs and benefits of its involvement in this scenario? Well, they're, they're far beyond any rational calculation. I, it, as I've tried to stress it. It all started with Obama on the phone whispering sweet nothings into the year, the year of Erdogan. Uh, and now Erdogan has uh, bet his entire prestige, and I'm afraid Foreign Minister Davu told you also. So they've, they've made this commitment, uh, and uh, they feel that if they, if they can't um, go all the way, that that will be a fatal blow to their political prospects, which it may well be. As we're finding here in the United States with, uh, with Afghanistan, getting out of these engagements is, is the hardest part, uh, and that is when the, the danger to the country that's been attacking is the, is the greatest. So Erdogan is learning that painful lesson. But nevertheless, same forces in Turkey should say, stop this now. Uh, this is bad for Turkey. Indeed. Dr. Webster Griffin Tompley, author and historian from Washington. Thanks to you for sir. Hello, everyone. Welcome to GGN. Today is Friday, January 25th, 2013, and I'm Darko. All right, so just going off that uh, video with Webster Tarpley talking about Turkey, um, I've covered Turkey a lot as far as this whole Syrian um, invasion goes, and they've been uh, part of the kidnappings, uh, part of the skyjackings, part of the arming and funding terrorists. Um, and along with that, you have Yemen seizes cargo with Turkish-made guns. Yemen captured another cargo of assault rifles originated from Turkey at the southern port of Aden. The latest incident marks the second time in a month that Yemeni authorities find a gun cargo shipped from Turkey. It says here that a, um, officials from Yemen had seized around 3,000 pistols wrapped in biscuit boxes inside a container that had come from Turkey. 
However, Ankara denied that it had authorized the arms shipment to Yemen, saying customs authorities at Turkey's port were told that the cargo consisted of biscuits and other uh, food items. Then uh, we have this article right here. Turkey uh, says that Syrian regime's actions equal war crimes. Syria's bombardment of its citizens should be declared a war crime, and aid groups must be given greater access to millions there, Turkey's foreign minister told the World Economic Forum. Pretty interesting. Uh, he expected the UN Security Council to step in and stop this bloodshed. What bloodshed is he talking about? Saying the Syrian regime, uh, what they've been doing, which is bombarding cities by airplanes. Hmm. Kind of like what France is doing, but see, that's a humanitarian mission. Yet this is a humanitarian mission as well. France says they were frustrated as efforts fail to topple Bashar al-Assad. France says the developments in Syria have been unfolding against what Paris has hoped for. It says here that the French foreign minister said on Thursday that things are not moving, the solution that we had hoped for, and that by that I mean the fall of Bashar and the arrival of the opposition coalition to power has not happened. In December of last year, this same individual had said that, quote, the end is nearing, end quote, for the Syrian president. However, remarkably shifted his stance on the crisis in Syria, stating that the efforts to oust the Syrian government were not getting anywhere. France had become the first European country to recognize Syria's opposition coalition, compromise many of them as terrorists and foreigners. On November 13, 2012, Paris said it would look into the issue of arming the militant groups in uh, Syria. Well, I can guarantee or bet my life on it that they wouldn't be the first country that would, quote, maul arming their opposition. Russia wraps Syria's opposition for obsession with toppling Assad. Goes on here, says, uh, this is what Lavrov, uh, Russia's foreign minister, said, for now everything is running up against the opposition's obsession with toppling Bashar al-Assad's regime. He told the reporters on Wednesday, quote, as long as this irreconcilable uh, position remains in place, nothing good can happen. Armed actions will continue uh, and people will die. The UN Secretary General sees, quote, not much prospect of resolution, end quote, of Syria civil war by diplomacy. Ban Ki-moon says he doesn't see much of a prospect of resolution of Syria's civil war by diplomacy, so they got to do the bloodshed. But then Russia is saying, what, there is no, uh, that there's, you know, basically there's going to be armed actions continuing and people will die, so there's going to be more bloodshed and nothing can come of it. So you can see all these weird um, hypocrisies and double standards and double speak that's going on here. Um, they would speak, they would cease fire, the Syrian government that is, and they will, um, uh, you know, basically consider different solutions and stuff like that, but they don't want to be told by foreign countries uh, what to do with internal affairs. But you see the UN, they don't really, they, you know, just like the world powers like France and NATO and all them, they don't care about dialogue. They want regime change, and they'll carry out the bloodshed like Lavrov was talking about until they get it. Everything between, like Kofi Annan's peace deal, is just, you know, for public consumption and just basically killing time until they get what they want. Syrian troops kill several militants in clashes, so they kill a number of militants in fresh clashes as the army continues operations across the country to drive out foreign-backed armed groups. It was in the northwest city of Aleppo as anti-government forces set fire to a gas station in the uh, city's suburbs. They also attempted to storm the airport in the city, but were confronted by army troops and were forced to flee with a number of casualties. The army also defused several explosive devices planted on a road near western city of Homs. Damascus, they've been really having a lot of explosions, suicide bombers. Again, like I said, it's an act of desperation. So there's there's some truth to what uh, to what Tarpoli was saying, which is Syria and Russia hang, hanging tough against NATO assault. And uh, right here, with what they were talking about with France, saying they're frustrated as their efforts to uh, get the regime change have failed. Life in Lebanon, horrible for Palestinian fleeing uh, Palestinians fleeing Syria, so they've gone back to using uh, refugees. I don't think they've ever actually stopped using the refugees and that, and those caught in the crossfire as, um, you know, as political pawns and stuff like that. So the same countries in that that uh, support NATO and the same countries that, that uh, and the UN and the same countries that the UN and NATO support, they're all for this. They're all on board. So they're helping to create this crisis. They're helping to create this uh, you know, 20 in a room with no water, fresh air, electricity, they had, you know, they had all that before the terrorists that they backed uh, went in there and did what they did. You have Iran aid convoy delivered to Syrian Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. So the Iran's first uh, consignment of humanitarian aid has been delivered to Palestinian Syrian refugees. Syrian rebels burn and plunder religious sites, human says Human Rights Watch. 
So they said the rebels have looted and burned minority religious sites in northern Syria. The attacks highlight the increasingly sectarian nature of the conflict as bloodshed continues unabated. The three incidences took place in November and December of last year. They said that rebels looted two Christian churches in separate villages in relatively peaceful western government of Latakia. Yeah, they've also blown them up, too. They're out on live leak. They've also destroyed a Shiite, uh, Husenya, a religious site devoted to Hussein, a martyr in Shiite tradition, and Idlib. So moving on here, we have U.S. propped up extremist groups in Syria. So in 2007, Wall Street Journal published an article titled, To Check Syria, U.S. Explorers Bond with Muslim Brothers. And even then, it was noted that the Brotherhood, Muslim Brotherhood, that is, that like Morsi got swept into power in Egypt, held close links with groups the United States recognizes as and lists as terrorist organizations, including Al-Qaeda. So the report is a disturbing foreshadowing of U.S. support that would eventually see the Muslim Brotherhood rise as both political and terroristic power across the Arab world. So it goes on here and it says that, in fact, 2007 Wall Street Journal described specifically uh, that the U.S. partnership could destabilize governments in Jordan and Egypt and two U.S. allies where the Brotherhood is growing in opposition for us, yeah, like in Egypt. And Egypt, or I'm sorry, in Jordan, they're now seeing increasing unrest led by the Jordanian arm of the Brotherhood. But uh, I guess the king got his, uh, got his votes, so. But uh, they're both, this, you know, what is it, uh, two sides of the same coin or two faces of, the, you know, whatever. Uh, it's the same thing. So if you get the Brotherhood, Muslim Brotherhood, you get a Western uh, uh, proxy, uh, controlled by Zionists, of course, and then you get the right, you know, the King Abdullah and Jordan, you know, he's cozy with Israel and the Zionists as well, so, you know, in the end, the Jordanians lose, Jordanian people. So it goes on here in this article by Seymour Hirsch, it talks about uh, these protests that were going on outside Damascus embassies, and it says here they were here to protest the Syrian president's Assad's rule. The participants shouted anti-Assad slogans and raised banners proclaiming change the regime now. But later in the article it revealed that the National Salvation Front, NSF, was in contact with the U.S. State Department and that a Washington-based consulting firm in fact assisted the NSF in organizing the rally, just like in Russia, right? But they actually caught on uh, uh, photographs of uh, filing into uh, the State Department an embassy, I'm sorry, the uh, embassy in Russia. So, another State Department operation. Goes on, it says, just like the Arab Spring, what was in fact a foreign-backed sedition was peddled publicly by professional PR firms with the help of bought-off complicit corporate media as a pro-democracy uprising. And while Wall Street Journal then, just as the U.S. State Department and Western media houses are now portraying the Syrian opposition as representing wide range of interests across Syrian society, it was admitted then, just as it is plainly obvious now that the sectarian extremists Muslim Brotherhood was in fact the very center of the uprising. The power struggle that will destroy Syrian militants, says the Iranian lawmaker, says there are many personnel and political disagreements among the various Syrian opposition groups to assume key positions of the leadership. Uh, the politician says there's two major reasons behind the failure of the militants and the opposition groups in Syria. The first cause for the militants' failure is that they are a tool in the hands of Western Arab powers. Therefore, they do not have any popularity and legitimacy among the Syrian nation. Saudi Prince calls for Syria militants to be given sophisticated weapons. Goes down and says that Prince Turkey Fossil, former intelligence chief and brother of the Saudi foreign minister, made remarks on Friday at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. What is needed are sophisticated high-level weapons that can bring down planes, can take out tanks at a distance. This is not getting through. He admitted that his country is arming the militants fighting against Damascus government justified Riyadh's anti-Syrian move as leveling the playing field. This is his quote. I'm not in government, so I don't have to be diplomatic. I assume we're sending weapons, and if we're not sending weapons, it would be a terrible mistake on our part, adding that you have to level the playing field. Most of the weapons in the rebels have come from captured Syrian stocks. Syria calls on refugees to return home, those citizens who have left the country due to unrest that began nearly two years ago to return home whether they left legally or illegally. When you have Syrian government allows exiled opposition to return home for dialogue, rebels intensify attacks. The invitation to the exiled opposition came on the basis of recent proposals by Assad, who also talked about ceasefire and the establishment of a broad-based government and parliament. This is GGN, and I'm Darko. Thank you.